Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me today for this briefing. And thanks to all that are likely watching on YouTube. I apologize for the delay. We were having some internet issues here at City Hall and um, have figured that out. And if something happens in the middle of this um, and there's a lag, we will try to recreate the information to share with everyone later. Um, so first off, I wanna say to each of you who have joined for this briefing to share with us information from your hospitals that I appreciate the time that you're taking and welcome to Sierra McIver, who joins us uh, most of the time when we're doing um, broadcasts here in our little room from City Hall. It's great to see you, Sierra, so that everyone can participate and know what's happening and, and take part in the information that's shared today. Um, I've asked um, each of these medical professionals here today um, because each of you see firsthand um, how COVID's impacts on our community, um, are, how it's spreading, um, the impact it's having on our hospitals, um, on regular care of people within Boise and in the region. Um, and we need to understand from you, you know, the steps that a city can take to address this, recognizing that a city alone can't do it all. Um, but I really appreciate the data that you have, your ability to tell us um, where things are now, and most importantly, where you expect things to be if action's not taken. Um, so, and I wanted to stream this on YouTube so that the public also has the opportunity to hear the information um, that we as decision makers are hearing um, to better understand how serious this is and how important it is that um, we take action together. Um, and with that, um, I will go ahead and just I'll introduce you as I call on you. And so first off, so today actually I'll let everybody know who's here so that um, folks know um, who they'll be hearing from. Dr. Jim Sousa is the Chief Medical Officer for the St. Luke's Health System. We have Odette Bellano, President and CEO of St. Al's. David Peterman, Dr. David Peterman, um, the CEO at Primary Health. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Steve Nemerson, the Chief Clinical Officer from St. Al's. And so I've asked each of these individuals to share with us um, information for about five minutes, and then I'll have some comments and thoughts to take away at the end. And with that, um, Dr. Sousa, would you um, kick us off? Sure thing. Thank you, Mayor McLean. Appreciate the opportunity. I, I'd like to share some uh, facts about what's uh, actually happening inside our health system as COVID um, is kind of spreading out of control in our communities. Our inpatient census of COVID patients has been steadily rising over the past six weeks. Um, we're the largest uh, healthcare system in Idaho, so our numbers might be higher than most, but just for perspective, in the first week of October, we had a daily average uh, census of COVID adult hospitalizations of 35. One week later, it was 50, then 75, then 90, then 110, then 120, and it hit 135 yesterday. Um, our intensive care unit admissions with COVID have gone from single digits in early October to mid-teens by mid-October then 20 early this month and hit 24 yesterday. This is all added on top of our usual operations of people getting sick from you know, any number of other ailments. In addition, our own people are getting sick, which limits our capacity to be able to provide care. You need healthy staff to take care of the patients. And today, uh, right now today, we have 197 clinical staff out sick with 133 of those being confirmed COVID. Four weeks ago, that was less than a third of our absences were, were due to COVID. Now that's at, at two thirds. I, I'd like to share what we're doing about this. Um, uh, feels like literally everything we can. In Twin Falls, we closed our pediatric unit uh, weeks ago in order to make uh, more capacity for uh, adult patients. Our Twin Falls Hospital has intermittently been uh, on and off divert for the past three weeks, which means that they can't admit any other patients. So they send them here to Boise or Meridian for care. Other hospitals have also intermittently been on divert in our health system. Uh, we've taken the action now to stop scheduling any non-urgent, non-emergent surgeries until after Christmas. And we're actually actively canceling uh, any of those that were already on the books week by week. We're pulling out the stops on incentives for our employees to take more shifts, longer shifts, night shifts, 
um, and honestly, they're running out of gas. We've uh, started to pull clinic doctors into hospital rotations to staff the beds. So we are now well beyond normal staffing uh, operations and approaching the limits of what we're gonna be able to do. We've also been preparing to increase our capacity in the last uh, week. We've opened two new units and filled them. You know, what's at stake here is I think one of two scenarios if we as citizens don't each individually take the actions we need to to stop the spread of COVID. One of two things is gonna happen. First, the first one's kind of already happening. It's happening to us and I think it's happening to other healthcare systems as you'll hear. We are prepared to progressively convert our hospitals into COVID facilities. This will mean though that, you know, other necessary care is put off. For visibility, we're still working through the backlog of elective screening studies that were created by the PAWS way back in March and April. Now these are not urgent and they're not emergent, but they are important. And to the degree that we continue to delay these screening studies, we're gonna have curable conditions that can be found early, become uncurable ones that we find late. We also have patients who actually need surgical relief just to manage their pain, whether it's musculoskeletal or abdominal or, or somewhere else. So that's already happening and it will continue to build up and get worse. The, the other thing though that will happen here if we don't get a handle on this is that as the COVID activity continues to rise, our ability to turn our hospitals expand into COVID facilities will reach its limit. It will reach its natural limit and the governor will be forced to institute crisis standards. And this means healthcare providers would need to make triage decisions and actually ration care to those most likely to survive. We do not have to end up there. That scenario is entirely preventable if we all act together. You know, uh, maybe the last point on the, on the update is that we're in the just in case business. In other words, People expect that our services will be here just in case. So just in case your dad falls and breaks his hip, just in case your mom gets dizzy and has a stroke, just in case your spouse gets COVID and happens to be in the unlucky minority who gets really sick. If crisis standards are implemented, people are gonna be caught by surprise because these sorts of therapies might not be available. And you know, if we let that happen, it's gonna be our collective fault as citizens. When you watch a train coming down the track toward you, I suppose you tell yourself it might stop, but it probably won't, so you get out of the way. We've been giving this message as healthcare providers since April, and we are starting to wonder if anyone's listening. Um, I, you know, I, I think action that could help uh, Mayor McLean would be to activate the business community to support those businesses that are actually employing good practices um, and bumping into citizens that are not wanting to adhere to those practices and to bring enforcement and consequences to those businesses that are, are not employing uh, good practices. I, I think that that clarity would help and um, and realize we're speaking to you in your role as the, the mayor of Boise. And as I've said multiple times before, th this isn't just a Boise thing. This is a regional and statewide thing. So, you know, ideally we'd have uh, action that's quite a bit more broad, other municipalities, other counties, but thank you for um, convening us today. Thank you, Jim. I was having trouble unmuting. I appreciate your comments. Um, and really, I'll say this at the end for everybody, but please extend my deepest gratitude and our city's gratitude to your healthcare workers who are really on the front lines. Um, I share your concerns and desire to prevent um, getting to the point where hospitals and, do and doctors and other healthcare workers are having to make those life and death calls um, in the future. Um, Odette Bellano, President and CEO of St. Al's 
health system. I'm welcome, and you're up. Thank you. And so I think you're going to hear us um, tell very similar stories. Uh, Dr. Emerson will talk in a bit about our experience at CNLs, but it's not much different than what you heard from uh, from Jim a minute ago. Okay. What I'd like to talk to you is just from an administrator, from a CEO's perspective. And again, I will touch on some of the um, same points because the the solutions are very easy. Uh, as Jim said, we've been talking about this. I count 10 months um, of you know having the same conversation. We've done PSAs, we've done press conferences, trying to appeal to people about the impact. And what I keep reminding people is that the hospitals are a lagging measure. Like when everybody's interested on what's happening in the hospital, like we've lost the train, right? And we have to understand that just looking at whether or not um, hospitals are full or you know what's going on is not the greatest indicator. It's like the end of the trail. So a um, couple of things that I'd like to focus on uh, just from a, a broader perspective is if you look at, you know we're all scientists in healthcare. We, we really follow the science. I think you're gonna hear from the three physicians that that is our mantra. And if we follow the science, there has just been a um, study by the Journal of um, Medicine that published that if you, if you take away what happened early on in the pandemic where we were all learning about what precautions we should be taking and there was the crisis of uh, uh, scarcity of PPE and all those things. If you kind of just pull that away and you look at the health systems that have implemented really strict precautions, masking, social distancing, physical distancing, frequent hand washing, there is absolutely almost no transmission from COVID patients to healthcare workers. The healthcare workers that Jim talked about, the healthcare workers that we have out, and I think uh, Steve has that statistic for us, are all because people are getting it in the community. I think that that's really important to understand. And as Jim said, we need our healthcare workers. They don't, they don't have a choice. They're here to serve this community. And when the community doesn't respect the need of us needing to get keep our people safe in order for them to do their job for the community, it's a little bit disheartening. I have to tell you, it's just really uh, gut-wrenching. And when we go up and we round on our staff and we hear about their exhaustion, and by the way, they're exhausted from their jobs and what they're doing and what they're seeing the community do and not do, but they also are going through everything that each and every single one of us is going during the pandemic. So you know, the, the toll on the healthcare worker is huge. And we, when we continue to understand the mental health issues that are coming out of this because of the decisiveness, divisiveness of our community on, do I feel safe because people are or aren't masking, you know, everybody has a different uh, decision point, municipalities are doing different things and people are confused. All we do is create more and more confusion in our environment. I think that, you know, what do we need from the communities? What do we need from local uh, leadership, public leadership to do is to come together collectively. This is an incredible community. I have loved every minute of being here because it is a community that pulls together. But unfortunately we have been divided in this situation. But we know that masking if you just take healthcare where we have, you know, 145, 80 patients, you know, our, what we call our Fury clinics that are testing people that are, you know, positive. We have positivity rates in our Fury clinics of 25%. That means that our staff is being exposed every single day. They're wearing the appropriate PPE. They are not getting sick. And so I think that that should be proof enough for our community that masking, social distancing, limiting large gatherings for probably, and I you know, will allow the docs to correct me if I'm wrong, but for the next you know, 60 days, 60 to 90 days, this is where we just have to hunker down and not let our foot off the pedal. There's light at the end of the tunnel. There's great information coming out about vaccines. We have Pfizer and Moderna that are showing incredible efficacy. We're still a lot of information 
but there is light at the end of the tunnel. I know the complacency and feeling tired of what we've been doing for 10 months is a little bit overwhelming, which allow, you know, allows us all to say, what the heck, I'm just going to go back to my normal life. But what I'm here to share with you is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We could be way beyond where we are by spring. And so if we've been doing and preaching what we need to do for the last 10 months, is it really too much to ask to save lives, to have compassion for our healthcare workers, to ask you to double down and help us for the next 60 days? So those are my comments, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Odette, really appreciate it. And again, gratitude to your team as well for everything. And I, I appreciate also the, you said to me last night, you said again, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I thought quite a bit about that yesterday evening after we spoke, because we are so close. We're very close. Um, Dr. Peterman, David Peterman from Primary Healthcare. Uh used to be just Dr. Souza doesn't uh, unmute. Now, apparently I have that. that well, and issue. me too today. So we're just, you know, having tech issues all around. No, just, just don't tell my children that I, that I don't seem <laughs> to get this. Um, and they're, they're young adults. They're certainly not children. Um, I think Dr. Nemerson was going to go before me. Mayor. Oh, all right. Go ahead, so, Dr. Nemerson. Uh, um, I, I think he's appropriate follow-up to uh, Odette uh, oh, coming from point. St. House. So okay. let's let Dr. Nemerson go first and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll speak. Great, thanks. Welcome, Dr. Nemerson. Thank you for having me. Is the connection clear? Because I noticed there's intermittent lag. I am hearing you all right. Yeah, and seeing you okay. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. I just wanted to check. Um, so, Mayor, thank you for having me this morning. And uh, Dr. Peterman, thank you for the grace of letting me go before you to uh, continue on the St. Alphonsus journey story. Um, ours is very much a mirror of the St. Luke's story. So in terms of uh, our numbers, very, very, very similar. First, I just wanted to call out the community incidents of COVID so that the um, those listening in understand how severe the spread of COVID is in our community. We use a number called the active cases per 100,000, um, depending upon where you look for a reference. Sometimes it's over a day, sometimes it's over seven days. The seven day figure uh, in Ada County is over 800 cases per 100,000. Uh, greater than 100 is considered severe present, pre, excuse me, severe prevalence. So it's really out of control. The other thing that we look at is our testing positivity rate. Dr. Peterman, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, but a number greater than 5% is considered uh, an uncontrolled pandemic. And in our system, we're seeing testing positivity rates greater than 25%. These are record numbers. We have not seen these numbers this high since the very beginning of the pandemic, even in July. With regard to then our hospitalized patients, that number as Odette referenced tends to lag. So um, what we're seeing in terms of primary care and testing positivity today, we'll see in the hospital in about two weeks. We're seeing record numbers too. Um, our total inpatient census right now of COVID positive patients is a little bit over 60. Um, and that number has been growing, obviously. Uh, that is about 20% of our total inpatient volume. And uh, when we reach 20% based on uh, previous surges that we've experienced, that's the point at which we need to ramp down uh, the non-urgent procedures and care that we provide. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, so. We've got that going on. And then the other thing we've got going on is our total staffed bed census is at a record high. Um, we're in many clinical units exceeding 100% of staff bed capacity. And what that means is then the clinical care teams need to take care of more patients in an individual um, unit than they usually do. And to do that, they need to modify the way that they deliver care, um, obviously, prioritizing urgent page, patient need with um, other non-urgent things like uh, 
going, taking care of a patient um, who needs to go to the bathroom or who needs to wash their face, that may be delayed. And so we're starting that as well. Um, in terms of big picture then, where we are right now, um, we've activated our next level of surge plan. We have, um, as St. Luke's has, uh, limited and discontinued certain elective procedures. Um, and that these are not facelifts. These are not um, uh, cosmetic surgeries. We're talking about spine surgeries. We're talking about joint replacements. We're talking about other uh, procedures that are not emergent, um, but certainly are painful and disabling to patients and now they need to wait. Um, the, the last thing I'll tell you is we're, we have opened, as St. Luke's has, some uh, clinical areas that we previously had not required um, in order to accommodate the increased COVID volume and to make sure that we keep COVID patients separate from non-COVID uh, patients receiving care within our hospitals. Our ER um, visits have gone up. The demand for testing has doubled over the past six weeks. Um, and then finally, as we look at this whole big picture, I think the obvious question is, where are we going and how quickly? Uh, we do predictive modeling that we review on a daily basis. Uh, with current trend that we do not expect, unless the community radically changes its compliance with uh, masking and other uh, social distancing and crowd size limitations, um, within approximately the next four to five weeks. So by Christmas time, we expect a doubling of the census of COVID patients within our hospitals. Um, and then within two months from now, approximately a tripling thereof. And that's the point at which we then um, begin to take care of patients in, in areas of our facilities that are not traditionally used for clinical care, things like conference rooms and so forth. God forbid we get to that situation, but we're prepared to do so. Um, so that's the future that we're looking at based on uh, the predictive modeling that we have in place. And I will tell you that it has been highly accurate up to this point in time. Um, we started talking about these figures a couple of months ago, anticipating the surge and our predictive modeling consistently is tracking uh, according to what we're seeing now for um, patients coming to us. And I, I think that's really what I have to share. My ask of the community and, and you is really compliance with existing mandates. Uh, I just wanna mention that face covering means covering the nose and mouth and slipping the mask below the nose is not just cheating, it totally eliminates the effectiveness of the face covering. Um, so that needs to be uh, as best as possible enforced. Limiting crowd size significantly, um, discontinuing social gatherings, and uh, really a complete re-examination of approval of public events that exceed a crowd size of 10, uh, even in an outdoor setting. And the reason for that is that despite our best intentions, the ability to police the behavior of the public is, is really troubling. It's easier to not have an event than it is to invite people in and have to deal with the few of, of those people who don't listen to or follow the, uh, the mandates. Um, and uh, anecdotally, I will tell you that we've even had some patients come in who've gotten into fights over this stuff and it is not worth having a trauma um, to have to try and get somebody to comply with a mass mandate. So thank you for allowing me to share. Um, we are, uh, last thing I wanna say is, we are here for the community. Um, as, as bad as this gets, we will continue to um, provide care as, uh, at the state of the art standard that we can um, and as best we can, hope, hoping that of course not to get into crisis standards. Thanks Dr. Jemerson. I have a question just as a follow-up. Um, and I appreciate all the models that all of you have shared with us um, over the months. It's It's been really helpful in making decisions, but also seeing the likely impact of new decisions or requirements that we might put on our residents to protect the community. The, the question I had with the models that you're looking at right now, Dr. Nemerson, is, is that with the doubling by Christmas, tripling two months from now, um, with the with maintaining things as they are, so without any um, changes that we might make as a community in terms of requirements or enforcement? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. And um, and I'd also have Dr. Peterman um, and Dr. Souza chime in, but uh, we're very, very concerned about the upcoming holidays, both Thanksgiving and Christmas, because uh, not only is the virus spread in social settings, uh, you know, public events, bars, this sort of thing, but um, but we're also we've also seen and know that. Uh, one family getting together with another family is a very common uh, spreader event opportunity when uh, someone who's thought to be COVID free, but actually doesn't have COVID symptoms and is harboring the virus transmits it to others. So those Christmas and Thanksgiving um, gatherings that we love to have, they really need to not happen this year. Well, I, I add to uh, Dr. Nemerson's comment uh, that unfortunately our modeling has also been um, accurate. Long about the middle of October, I had an opportunity to speak with Central District Health. At that time, I was pointedly asked, what, what census do you predict you'll have by November 9th? And I just looked at our model and regurgitated 120 to 160. We hit 125 on November 9th. As I already shared, we hit 135 uh, yesterday. Uh, the first week in December, if you wanted to know, we're, we're predicting a 30% increase over the numbers we have today. Um, so we wouldn't be at 200 yet, but we'd be in the high 100s. Um, that, that's just, and unfortunately, as Steve said, those, those keep turning out to be right. If we take action, we can change that. Thank you. All right, Dr. Peterman. Okay, thanks. I think I've unmuted. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah. So um, my, my, I'll try to be brief. Uh, let me speak first to just sort of where we're at and then uh, lead into some recommendations uh, for you, Mayor. So on a weekly basis, I send uh, our graphs, our data, not only to you and other public fish officials, but to uh, Dr. Susan and Dr. Nemerson. And I dread sending it to them. Um, sometimes I put comments, sometimes I don't because I'm so worried about it. But as, as Dr. Susan mentioned, um, we're the tip of the spear. And so as our numbers go up, it's what the hospitals will see in 10 to 12 days. And so when I tell you and I tell the public on the phone how busy we are, um, we should be very, very concerned because it's the most accurate data that there is as to what's happening in the community. On a, on a normal day uh, in November, Primary Health Medical Group would get 1,800 phone calls through all our clinics. We're now over 3,000. Uh, in July, when we had a peak in this disease that was higher in March and we were all concerned, Primary Health was testing two, 300 uh, into patients a day wanting tests for coronavirus. And we thought that was a lot. Today, we're over 600. I've gotten three texts this morning, which have told me all our clinics are full and half the clinics are full tomorrow for testing. And I've also gotten two, te two texts from people I know personally asking me how they can be tested, which tells you in a sense we're getting closer and closer uh, to, to what I would almost describe as dire or, or desperate. We're not there yet, but we're getting uh, closer. Um, in terms of the community spread, uh, what hasn't been mentioned here, but, but both Jim and Steve have this same issue, which is with the community spread, we now have 30 to 40 of our staff out daily. I was told this morning it's 35. Uh, at, at one point, we had 10 of our providers out. Again, they did not get COVID from our clinics. It was from community spread. They either had a positive test or they had symptoms or they required quarantining. We've had to close six of our urgent care clinics at various times because we couldn't staff them or we had to shift staff and providers to our respiratory clinics to do uh, COVID uh, testing. Um, now, our job as primary care as pediatricians, family docs, internists, 
we, we basically have two jobs. We, we, we try and keep you healthy. That's our best job. We do all the preventive things. The, the other job is uh, if you trip and sprain your ankle or fracture your ankle, um, if your child has an earache, uh, if someone has a sore throat, all those different things, you go to urgent care or you call your primary care doctor. Um, right now, I just explained to you that we have over 3000 phone calls a day. I can't guarantee you that we can answer every phone call timely. I can tell you the front office staff now uh, is exhausted. I had to call one of our clinics on Sunday. The, the, what we call CSR had 10 people on hold. I, I was almost embarrassed that I called to ask something. The point being is, if we can't take care of your children who have earaches, if we can't take care of your grandparent who now has a minor illness and shouldn't be in the emergency room, we're in trouble. Again, our job as primary care is to keep you out of the hospital and take care of the minor illnesses. If we have to default to sending you to the emergency room, um, it, I don't know how else to say it, that's not going to work today. And so um, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how critical the issue is right now. I, I have the most gray hair uh, of this panel. I've been here the longest. I have never seen anything like this, and it is very, very worrisome. Um, what was described as, uh, again, in primary care, same thing. We have uh, people doing extra shifts. We have people very tired. Um, and uh, again, those people on the front lines who are answering the phone calls are dealing with people asking them all kinds of questions that go beyond just, can I get an appointment? Because people are getting to the level of, of, of close to desperate. So that's the setting. I'm not saying anything different than the two other doctors, except for we're primary care. And if you overwhelm primary care, the community is really in trouble. So let's move to, to my recommendations. Um, First, uh, I'm sure the other physicians would agree that we, will, we appreciate and we compliment you for being, if not the first public official in Idaho, one of the first to actually require masking. Um, and um, I know that you personally took uh, a lot of negative press uh, personally and publicly, but we all appreciate it and it was the right thing to do. Um, Today, um, if you, there's an article that was in Nature Magazine, one of the most prestigious in the world, um, and it tracked people in 10 major cities um, through cell phones. So it's very, very accurate. And it looked at these people who had positive coronavirus tests, and we're talking about thousands of people. 80% of the positive tests came from bars, cafes, restaurants, and other crowded businesses. And so again, we know what the problem is here. So um, if I move to recommendations, sh short of closing these institutions, there is data to say that when you limit the number of people in these businesses and you require mass, it's incredibly effective. And so, um, what I've just described, actually, my, uh, you've already mandated these, these uh, regulations, but they haven't been followed. So if I were to ask the mayor to take an action, I would ask you to enforce these rules however you can. Of course, I agree with Jim and Steve. I'm asking the public directly to do this, but people don't always follow the rules. And so as a public official, you have to do difficult things. And so if I were to make a recommendation to you, it would be enforcement of these rules you already have in place. And because the, the, the next step is you'll be forced to close them. Um, I think, you know, and I'm open for questions. Uh, uh, and I, I think that's, you know, um, very consistent with, with Odette and the other doctors on the call. Well, thanks, David. Um, I appreciate your candor and the candor of each of you. Um, and of course, wanna thank each of you and your teams for the service that you're providing. 
You know, there are um, things that we need to do as a community and then um, things that we are looking at as a city to make sure that we can protect our community. So I appreciate your suggestions, the support you provided. Um, and I wanna um, make it clear that our team here at the city of Boise is working on a plan right now um, that will enable us to protect the public through enforcement of orders. Um, it might be that the orders look a little different than they did because we need to have teeth um, that is a city we can uphold. Um, and we wanna do that um, not only to protect the public and in partnership with businesses, but because we have a city to run. And as you said, all of your employees um, that have become sick or getting sick from community spread, we're saying, saying the same thing as with our city employees. And we've got to make sure that we're able to pick up the garbage and keep the sewer and running so that we've got clean water to make sure that our public safety officers are healthy to protect the community. So all of that um, goes into account in our thinking too. So our goal, um, as and each of you alluded to it, rather than shutting everything down, um, using an ax, if you will, we want to use a scalpel and really um, look at how we can um, come up with a framework in partnership with businesses um, that allows us to celebrate and partner and support those that are doing well, um, perhaps by providing the help to them that they need um, when cu customers refuse to comply with the rules we have in place. Um, but then also partner and celebrate businesses that are um, following protocols and protecting our people by holding others accountable. And so we expect within the week I'm not only to have announcements related to city services and how we can ensure that our city employees stay healthy or are healthy when they're on the job so we can continue to provide services, um, but also a framework um, to make sure that moving forward, we've done what we can as a city to change the course of those models um, in the next couple of weeks. And, you know, I want to say in closing, of course, first off, thanks to all of you, um, but to the public, we are so close, people. Um, we really, as Odette said, we are so close. And um, we've been at this for 10 months. A vaccine is on the horizon. We're seeing numbers like these medical professionals and others never imagined we've seen um, because we've gotten tired um, and because there are um, actors out there that aren't following the rules and because we've become divided as a community. And um, so I was thinking last night after Odette talked to me about how close we are, of a girls on the run team. This is an organization, I'm just gonna tell you a story. This is an organization that works with young girls, usually second, third, fourth grade um, on confidence, speaking, all these different skills through running. And when I came home just a couple days ago, I live um, close to a school. These young girls were running in front of my house. And I noticed as I was unloading the groceries that they were running multiple times because I saw Piper, this um, girl in the neighborhood, a third time. And I said, Piper, what are you doing? You look exhausted. And she's like, oh, this is girls on the run. And we have been running and we're trying to run a 5K. And I'm really tired. She stopped for a second. She's like, but I got to keep going because I only have to go around the school two more times. And that is exactly what we need to do. Um, in partnership as a community, recognize we just have to go around this a couple more times. Um, and that we as a city government with a great team here are looking at how we can help make that possible um, by holding those accountable that are making it harder. So I really appreciate the partnership that I have, we've had um, with each of you, um, and also fearful of what we're seeing and know that while one city can't have the impact our region, community, and state deserves, there are things that a city can do. And so look forward to getting feedback from each of you um, in the next day or so um, as we prepare to finalize um, the steps that we are willing to take um, and then share those with the, the public um, for the weeks and months to come. So thank you so very much. And thanks to the public that has joined us today. Um, know that these medical professionals and so many others are working like they've never worked before um, with our public safety and health and long-term resilience as a community at the center of everything they do um, as are we. Take care, everybody, be well. Thank you. Thank you.
something like that. And Airbnb was able to pivot. Now, they had to cut their workforce by 25% slash $800 million in uh, additional marketing expenses. But here they are, and they're coming to the table. So for me, it's impressive. Yeah, and Jared, to that point, uh, in that filing, Airbnb saying that 